And we're back with more of the Pope on Film. It's time, buddy! It's time! It's time! Yes, buddy, my friend, it is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on Film podcast to boot scoop boogie our way into the final half of our big shoe. And it is said final half, wherein we finally, in eventually, get around to discussing our all new low, fat, and high movie of the week. And this week, we begin our four-week tribute to the one and only uh, Bunny Williams with yet another Buntober celebration. Yes. That's when Bunny, for four episodes, or sometimes five, six, I don't know, where Bunny takes over the show, and this year, Buntober is a celebration of the works of legendary Spanish director Pedro Almodovar, and we will be celebrating him by watching the 1953 American monster flick known as The Beast. The Beast. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Yes. That was a scary, <coughs> scary close-up that I just did, but that's fine. Bunny, would you care to explain Buntober this year? Uh, well, I... Uh, Pedro Almodovar is one of those directors that I've really been meaning to get to for quite a lot of years, but hey, you know, you gotta wait in line you know, there's Alejandro Jodorowsky you know, you gotta get behind him, man you know um, Yeah. westerns, you have to get behind that black, black cinema you know, so yeah. Pedro waited his turn, patiently uh and I decided that this was the year to finally get to the great works of Pedro Almodovar. Uh, little, little known in America because we're racist and he's Spanish. Um, and this was, this was going to be the year. So I went and I tracked down a bunch of a really good selection of Pedro Almodovar films. They were all in Spanish, none of them subtitled. So, you know, after not having sex with the hot chick, you go home to your wife. And in this case, my wife is B-50s movies. Weed. So if I had a penny that is what we're doing. for every... If I had a penny for every 1950s B-movie that started with a bunch of boring narration, I would have a dollar, which is not a lot of money, but that's a shitload of pennies. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those films. But before we get to this week's film, The Beast, The Beast, The Beast, yes, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Uh, I have decided that's the way I'm going to say it for the rest of this podcast. Um, let's talk about the man in question, Mr. Pedro Almodovar. There's no... I keep wanting to pronounce Pedro Almodovar, but that's not his name. It's yeah. Pedro Almodovar, and I have a hard time saying that because that's how white I am. I'm too white for the browns and too brown for the whites. Um, but I consider myself a huge, big-time, bigly film historian. Yes. So we're going to do a quick bio of Pedro. Should come easy for me, with no mistakes, nudge, nudge, <coughs> wink, wink, no to me. So here is, in, in very simple terms, the life of Pedro Almodovar. He was born in Da Nang, South Vietnam in 1966. His family fled the country right before the fall of Saigon, few, and uh, Pedro would grow up to become a Silicon Valley software, software salesman. But he loved the movies. He especially loved the movies of 
Mr. Alfred Hitchcock. So uh, he would get his money from his work as a software salesman. He had a lot of money, enough money to be able to make some uh, low-budget movies, and he made a few. Then in 2010, he got his big break with his major film, Birdemic. Oh, wait. I may have fucked this up. Okay. Uh, oh, wait. No, this isn't Pedro Almodovar. This is... Uh, James Nguyen, the man who made the Birdemic trilogy. Uh oh. Trilogy. There's three of them. But um, I, I'm sure that at the next episode, where we continue our tribute to Pedro Almodovar, I'm sure I'll get the bio. Yes. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink, no to me. Uh, before we discuss the beast, I have a very personal Pedro Almodovar story. Okay. So, um, my ma, my mother, Teresa, Terry, she's still very much alive. Uh, she considered herself a very, very prim and proper woman. And she tried to have dinner ready for her husband by the time her husband came home from work. And, you know, she dressed up nice and she did her hair and she always dyed her hair black to hide the white hairs and and she was always very prim and proper a very prim and proper young woman but when she got with her relatives she could drink like two and a half Chris Farley's okay. it was freaking insane and like there would be like a family gathering and like they would be drinking and partying and drinking and going, and I'm like, I'm going to bed, and I go to bed, and then I wake up at like 7 a.m., and there's a massive pyramid of all the beers that they had drank. Just this big, massive pyramid. They always made a pyramid with their beers, and my mom would get sloppy ass drunk, just drunk as fuck with her uh, brothers and uh, sisters. She'd get wasted. Uh, so, it, most of the time this would happen in Douglas, Arizona, which is where most of my uh, family is from, from my mother's side. And they would stay up late drinking. And uh, I have a lot of cousins, so many cousins. And it was difficult because we would all stay in my grandparents' house. And so there's a guest bedroom and some people could sleep there. And then there's a couch, some people could sleep there. But a lot of times we would end up just sleeping on the floor of the living room. And so we were sleeping on the floor of the living room when, late at night, um, HBO decided to show Pedro Almodovar's Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down. Okay. Uh, so I saw that movie when I was about 11, maybe 12. Yeah. Probably 11. Um, I should not have been seeing this film. No, you shouldn't. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Antonio Banderas. Yes. He is this guy, and he's in a mental institution, and he gets released from the mental institution. Um, he says he's cured, but he's not cured. Uh, he believes that God has told him that his mission in life is to marry this famous celebrity and to have kids with her. So he kidnaps this woman, ties her up, ties her down, and uh, tries to force her into falling in love with him and there's a lot of nudity and a lot of graphic sex scenes there's a specific scene in a bathtub with a wind up doll toy that was burned into my brain I should not have seen this film and then you were staying in, in Douglas, Arizona for like a week and you know how HBO is They've got like a handful of movies and they just keep playing them over and over again. So I ended up watching Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down like three or four times when I was 11 years old and I should not have watched it. What I'm saying is, um, number one, this was my sexual awakening. Yes. On the floor of my grandparents' bedroom, which is a horrible place to do it. And number two, um, I am so happy that we will be spending four episodes uh, celebrating the life of Pedro Almodovar by not watching his movies. 
because I don't think I can watch Tiny Up, Tiny Down again. See, now, when Weird. I say that if I had watched Boxing Helena at the right time and the right yeah. place, mm -hmm. I'm talking about Tie Me Up, Tie Me Down. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I get that. Because I get that. That movie is fucking genius. I saw it pretty, you know, I saw it when it first hit video. Yeah. You know. And it, it had gotten a lot of critical acclaim and stuff like that before it. Uh, I believe Siskel and Ebert both liked it. You know, so so I definitely checked it out. That's not that was not the first Pedro Almodovar movie I had seen. The first yeah. was in 1990. I had just returned to school at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. And okay. I was wanting to get, because, like, I didn't take a language in high school, so I had to get yeah. the language requirement out of the way. So I was like, all right, yeah. fuck it, I'll, I'll sign up for the Spanish class. You know, I mean, having no particular interest other than just making the credit, you know? Yeah. So, uh, of course, for some reason, with me and school, when I decide to take a class, especially if it's something as completely normal as Spanish, okay? Yeah. The school system has always decided to fuck with me then. Hmm. So... They had decided that they had this new teaching technique for their Spanish class in which they would not speak English at all. Everything would be in Spanish. I so hated that. So that you can that. just absorb it. I hated them doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm so not much. paying you for me to absorb shit. I'm paying you to yeah. teach me shit. Yeah. So I did horrible, and I felt like a fucking moron, because everybody in the world can learn Spanish except for me. You know? And me! <laughs> yeah, right? And me. Both uh, of us together. But the one saving grace is that the teacher, undergrad student, undergrad, whatever the fuck he really was, he was a guy who was walking by one day he, he could speak Spanish and like, here, you have a class now. But he was a real film fanatic and he was planning on going off to film school at some point. So, a lot of the times, we would watch a Spanish language movie with subtitles. Okay. okay so Which like, movie did you see? Uh, for for that class, we had watched one of his really early works. What did I ever do to deserve this? Or what did I do to deserve this? Nice. Which was okay. which is more of a screwball comedy. Yeah. And unlike a, a any of his other work, really, you know. Huh. But but that was it. That was the start with me and Pedro Almodovar. Fascinating. Fascinating. That's the difficult thing with downloading movies is that I downloaded the director's cut of Midsommar. And so it's like, oh, sweet. Now I have this movie. I am going to watch it. There ain't no subtitles when you just download a movie. Yeah. I Like I need the DVD in order to really get the subtitles going. Yeah. So it's difficult. And but you can get the subtitle file, but I don't know what the fuck to do with it. Same. No idea. Yeah. Absolutely no idea. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But there you are. And that, of course, brings us to The Beast. The Beast. The Beast from 20,000. Oh. Well, well, now, now wait just before that. You know, because I did download four Pedro Almodovar movies. So this is all about my mother from 1999. 
but it's the beast from 2,000 fathoms. 20,000 okay. fathoms. Yes, All About My Mother. A.K.A. The All 19, About My Mother. The 1999 comedy drama. Yes. Uh, this film was a commercial and critical success internationally, winning the Academy Award for Best Foreign Language Film. I'm surprised that uh, MAGAs haven't gotten upset and demanded that America wins Best Foreign Language Film. I, uh, yeah. Seems like something they would do, doesn't it? Uh, it's hard to even fathom anymore what they might do, you know? It's, no, it's tough to fathom what they wouldn't do. Yeah. Yeah. So, um... Here is the story of uh, the lineage of the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. In 1952, they re-released King Kong into movie theaters. They re-released King Kong, and it was a smash hit. People were lining up around the block to go see uh, uh, King Kong, even though it was, you know, decades old at this point. Yeah. People were excited to see it. And so Warner well, like Brothers... like Star Wars. Yeah, like Star yeah. Wars. Like Star Wars. And so uh, Warner, Bro Warner Bros, I think that's how you pronounce it, Warner Bros, yeah. was all, somebody get me a King Kong ripoff. And then when you're done, get me pictures of Spider-Man. So, uh, boom. One year later... In 1953, in 1952, they re-released King Kong. A year later, in 1953, Warner Bros. releases The Beast of 20,000 Fathoms, and that's so successful that Toho sees The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms and says, Someone get me a Beast from 20,000 Fathoms ripoff in Japanese! And boom, one year later, in 1954, we get Gojira. And that, so it's really weird that King Kong and Godzilla would fight twice in movies yeah. when they're kind of related. Because mm -hmm. King Kong is the dad of the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, and then the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms has a kid, and that's Godzilla. But King Kong keeps coming back. Godzilla yeah. sure as shit keeps coming back. But as far as I can tell, the beast from 20,000 Fathoms is the deadbeat dad who left for smokes and never came back. That's, that is about it. It's very sad. Yeah. But I love this Much movie. Ran just... off with Gorgo. Yes, with Gorgo. Yes, very much so. Because Gorgo had that British accent that was just so fucking sexy. Yeah, 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 he was hot. Yeah. Uh, so here's a little mini chat. Uh, Raymond Frederick Harryhausen. Yes. I'm using his full name out of respect. Raymond Frederick Harryhausen was BFFs with Raymond Douglas Bradbury, yes. the famous author. So Bradbury visits... Harryhausen on the set, and it's like, hey, I was in the neighborhood, thought I'd see you on the set and say hello, what are you working on? And Harryhausen is all, oh, just this monster flick called uh, Monster from the Sea, and Bradbury says, oh, interesting, can I uh, read the script? Maybe I can do a rewrite on, on it. And Harryhausen says, sure, gives him the script, and uh, Raymond uh, uh, Raymond Douglas Bradbury is reading the script and he's all, huh this script sounds a bit familiar yes uh, it seems to be a rip off of my short story The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms that I wrote for the Saturday Evening Post hmm what should I do about this? Should I tell my manager? Should I confront Raymond Frederick Harryhausen, my good friend? Should I should I sue 
what should I do? But he wasn't able to decide what to do because a day later, uh, it's 1950. So uh, he gets a telegram from Warner Bros. Mr. Bradbury, stop. We wish to purchase the rights to your story, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Stop. We will pay $2,000. Stop. Please respond. Stop. And Bradbury was all like, well, that answers that fucking question. Yeah. And so a year later, after The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms came out, when it was time (coughs) to reprint, when it was time to reprint the story from the Saturday Evening Post, hey, we want to publish this story in this book of yours, Mr. Raymond Brad Douglas Bradbury. Uh, Bradbury's like, do me a favor. Retitle the story The Foghorn. Which I think is kind of catty of him. Yeah. I think he's still a little bit upset about uh, having his story being made into a movie before they even ask for the rights to the story. Yeah, he, That's he be. really should have thought about that a little more because because he's got them over a fucking barrel. Yeah, he does. You know, they have already invested a lot of money in making this movie and now yeah. they're going to go get the rights for it? Well, I know that's thank ridiculous. God they realize they do have to go get the rights. But at least yeah. So, so yeah. they're doing it right. They're just doing it half-assed. But... Yeah. <laughs> you say no, they're fucked. Yeah. Absolutely. You absolutely have them over a barrel. So get Bunny. your hurt feelings and built the motherfuckers. Hell yeah. And it's like, you know what? You can have the rights to my store. You can have them for free. You just need to do something for me. Get the Animaniacs out of the fucking water town. <laughs> I was going to say fuck a pig mm. on live TV. Eh, either or. Either or, really. So, Bunny, I know this is going to be difficult because there's so much substance. Oh, God, <laughs> yes. Within this film. Ah, oh, man, the twists, the turns. But... Do you think it could be possible, using your might and your knowledge? Yes. Do you think it would be possible for you to regale us with the plot of The Beast of 20,000? From 20,000. The Beast! The Beast! The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms! Oh, it looks like you knocked out your camera. Oh, yeah. I, I pressed a button. There you go. There you go. Hello! Oh! These uh, these extreme close-ups are difficult. So there's a beast. He comes to New York. He fucks. Where's he up, from? Where's he from? We, and is then he we from? kill him. That is basically the plot. Now the rest of the padding is uh, there is a military expedition to the Arctic where a man sees this creature. And is hurt in like an avalanche, something like that. Lands in the hospital. We we will forget his friend that got crushed to death. Not important. Never brought up again. Uh, yeah. But then he is in a hospital. He's trying to tell people that he saw this giant creature, and nobody will believe him. He, but and, oh. but he he pulls the card. He pulls the "Don't you know who I am?" card. Which is, yeah. I'm a scientist, therefore I cannot possibly be hallucinating this. So, yeah. whatever. But now he is obsessed to prove that he actually saw what he saw. Uh, that he isn't crazy. That he isn't crazy, yes. Uh, he hooks up with a hot paleontologist chick, somehow... I forget how. Does it fucking matter? There, Not really. There's so many hot paleontologists out there. Yeah. You know, when when they need a supermodel for the runway, they just head to paleontologist bars. Yes. Of which there are many. Luckily, she had 
col a, a huge collection of giant monster monk shots. Like you do when you're that, a paleontologist. That, yeah. that, that he had gone through. The, he, she made lovely little sandwiches. She made lovely. Little, they, they were cut on the diagonal with the crust cut off. Just, yeah. Donna Reed would be so proud of her. You know? Very much. Yes, very yes. much so. Um, so he eats a sandwich, and they they go through the they go through the giant monster mugshot book. Until... My favorite part is when my favorite part is when the paleontologist then got all of the monsters in a lineup. Yes, and they basically recreate the the opening of the usual suspects. Yes, one of the monsters keeps farting, and that's why they're laughing at the scene. Yes. And if it turned out that Beast from 20,000 Fathoms took a nap in the jail cell. Yeah. He took a nap in the jail cell, so we knew he's the one who knocked over the truck. Yeah. But anyway. Uh, <laughs> my, my favorite part of the movie, my favorite part of the Beast of 20,000 Fathoms is when the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms starts killing all of the other monsters who were involved in the Lufthansa heist. And you yeah. see, like, a monster in a freezer, and then you see one drowned, and the whole time they're playing the beautiful piano music from Layla. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant cinema. Yes. <laughs> do, 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 do. You see all the monsters. You see one shot dead in his car. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Uh, the, the, frightened by my own day. The monster attacks the ship, a la Godzilla. He also mm -hmm. attacks a lighthouse. Uh, he attacks some other shit along his way. Now, meanwhile, our scientist guy is trying to track down somebody else who has seen this monster. The guy from the shipwreck didn't want to talk to him. Oh, ten minute warning. Holy fuck. We're okay. having fun. Uh, but anyway, he finds another guy. I think he was from the lighthouse. I forget where he was from. But he they found him in the hospital and he was all crying and whining. Man, man, nobody believes me. Everybody thinks I'm nuts. It's all in my head. And he was like, oh, no, no, I believe you, I believe you, and, oh, we all love you, but here, look through this book and see if see if you can identify Kaiser Sose. So he goes through the book, and God damn it, he picks out the same monster, the same giant monster from the giant monster mugshot book. So, and then that's it. That's it now. That's all you need. Everybody believes them now. Uh, including the white-haired scientist. Which, yeah. white-haired scientist is going to pop up in a few of these movies. Oh, yeah. Played by different people, but still, white-haired scientist. That's yeah. him. So, he's like, oh my god, there's a monster on the loose. Call the, call the Pentagon. Uh, and he calls the, the guy from the expedition, whatever it was, um, Buzz Lightyear. Yeah, of Star Command. Of Star Command, yes. <clears throat> and tells him, this is real, we have to mobilize the, the army, and then that's, oh. what, that's what he does. He mobilizes the army, and then they look and see how he's attacking things down the coastline, so he's going to attack New York, and he does, and the blood is poisonous or some shit? I guess, off yeah. gaseous fumes, so they can't shoot it. Uh, they get Levon Cleef to shoot. Yeah, Levon Cleef. Yeah, he got a credit, Crazy. but like that was his only fucking scene. Yeah, Levon Cleef is in this. There are so many character actors in this, and he wore a big fucking hood through most of it. 
Yeah. Freaking Lee Van Cleef. You hire Lee Van Cleef for one reason and one reason only, and it's that fucking face. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the beginning of the movie, there are two people who have the first lines. The second one, the second person who has the second line in the movie, he's a radar technician. That's Sheriff Roscoe P. Coltrane. Really? Yeah. Nice. And then, like, I'm looking at the doctors in the hospital, and it's like, that one seems familiar. That one seems familiar. I gotta look this shit up. And sure enough, one of the doctors at the hospital who dismisses our hero owned McDougal's House of Horrors in Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. Oh. He's the pissed-off McDougal guy. And then the character of George Ritchie in this, he was the director of the Vita, Vita Mita Vegemin commercial in I Love Lucy. Okay. He was a director. I love this movie, but also, it's still a monster movie. Yeah. But you know what? I would like someone to see someone with talent in time. I would like someone to, because everything, everywhere, all at once is such a wonderful film. We actually sell rhinestone-studded Elvis jumpsuits at my work at the Halloween store. Yeah. And I've been thinking about purchasing one of those, dyeing my hair pink, and just carrying around a black bagel. And everyone will think I'm Elvis with a bagel and pink hair, when in fact, my costume is Jobu Tapaki. I think that would be great. Nice. But... Somewhere out there, there's an alternate universe where Godzilla never existed, and the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms got all of the Godzilla sequels. Yeah. So, there's a... The... A, a Gigantus, the Fathoms monster. Yeah. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms versus King Kong. Uh... A whole, a whole bunch of them. I could 100%. I can, if I pay attention and close my eyes and focus, I can see all of those movies. Because this is very basically an American ripoff of Godzilla before Godzilla. Yes. That is surprising that Godzilla got like 500 movies and the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms got one. The only real well, thing this movie has going in its favor is Ray Harryhausen. I would rather have his stop motion than some of the CGI that I see in movies today. Yeah. Because at times, this monster looks fucking realistic as shit. Yeah. But at, at right now, at this time in the year of our Lord, 2023, you see a CGI monster... You know it's a fucking CGI monster. Yeah, but the, the, but the thing is, is like that's all him. You know, that's yeah. like, like he went more. He went beyond just like animating it. He he was the one who was like, wouldn't it be funny if he got his foot stuck in a car? And there's a realism to that. He gets his foot stuck in a car. He scrapes it off, and then his tail drags the car. That's a level of realism that was not necessary that he specifically put in to make this look real. Yeah. And I, and it was just him. It was just that one guy. And I freaking love that. I love this movie, but at its heart, it's still a monster movie. But yeah. watching this film just makes me really appreciate Pedro Almodovar. Yes. You know? What an amazing film. I have to tell you this, Bunny. I have been having a hard time paying attention to our discussion of the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms because I keep staring at the flashing light in the middle of the smoke <laughs> like a fucking moth to flame. Yeah. I have just been staring at it. It is blind. It's calling me. I am going to cover it up. So, so I can, can focus, focus on, on the ending. ending. There you go. 
That is so much better. I can still see the flashing in my eyes. Yeah. That, that one's uh, not quite done yet. It, it looks, looks good, though. though. Yeah, thank you. It looks good. It looks like the 1980s HBO logo needs to come out of it. Yeah. Or uh, Thor and Loki. <laughs> Either or. Uh, so, Bunny, next week, we say next week, but it's two weeks from now. Next week, what is our movie? Next week, instead of Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown... From, I believe, off the top of my head, 1988. Um, again, critically acclaimed Pedro Almodovar movie. We will be doing the giant ant movie, Them. Yes! Damn. It is up on the cough cough. Uh, strongest female performance in a movie of this type ever by a child. We should we should do a uh, theme summer where we just do pronoun movies. We watch them, we watch it, the yeah. two it's, we watch us. Okay. It's, it's just a whole summer of pronouns. I can't think of any other ones. There's got to be some movie out there called E. Hour. Those movies have to exist. I'll try and figure it out. We can, we okay. can cheat and find a French movie. Oh, that's, that's true. true. Yeah. Um, so that is next week. We will be celebrating the film Woman on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown by watching the giant ant movie, Bam. Very excited about that. But now that I look back at this, uh, Sexual Awakening, Bird's Epic, uh, Raymond Douglas Bradbury, the Miracle Worker. Saw Patrol. I gotta say, I think this has been a pretty good episode. This has been a damn good episode. You know what? I, I, I concur. I concur with your assessment, good sir. So until next week, I am Bunny Williams. And I got this. And I am Reverend May Lynn, and on behalf of Eleanor and uh, everybody else who might be asleep, I just want to say thanks for listening, and we... Oh!